that has a sense for what we do and why. That has a sense for what we do and why. And, that's, and that is, um, and I say, look, you got to be willing to do it worth and all. As I said, there are some times we get it wrong. And when we get it wrong, we are going to report that. Um, and we've got to be willing to acknowledge that. We are not perfect. But nobody is trying to systematically undermine the rights of our citizens. They're trying to systematically bypass the laws that we are required to execute. Let's focus on thinking positive here. They get this guy mm -hmm. safely and alive. What is the first step that they take after they bring him into custody? Well, they have to put him his rights. And then after that? Then they're going to try to interrogate him. And I mean, obviously, if he's willing to talk. I mean, the FBI doesn't really interrogate him. You have to build a rapport and see if he's, you know, maybe make a little, give him some coke or whatever. Right. Make him talk. So to do that, I think we're looking at disclosing in a very public way more information than we've ever done before. Trying to engage in a broader public dialogue tonight is an example of that. Hey, so there's media here. Fine, they need to be here. Hey, I'm not screening questions. You need to ask what the audience has in mind and we'll take it from there. Um, Another point I try to make is, but it just can't be about NSA, defending NSA. That's a loser to me. It needs to be part of a broader dialogue. And we are very fortunate that we have some great partners out there who are willing to stand up and have that dialogue. Um, because I'm the first to admit, if it's just going to be about NSA talking about NSA, we're missing the boat, from my perspective anyway. Um, NSA needs to be a part of this dialogue, but it needs to be much broader. People need to understand, hey, look, there is a legal framework in position out there. We just don't unilaterally decide what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. We have a set of policy mechanisms that help shape what NSA focuses its foreign intelligence mission on. We have a set of court-directed compliance requirements where we have to make a case in many cases to get the authority or permission to do what we do. We have regular congressional oversight where we have to notify and I have to testify. I have to notify in writing and testify publicly as well as privately before our primary oversight committees. Uh, and, and I would certainly think in an intelligence activity that we undertake that has the potential for the kind of blowback we're seeing today would be something that you would want to report in considerable detail uh, to the committee. You know, sir, there are many things we do in intelligence that, if revealed, would have um, have the potential for uh, all kinds of blowback. I don't doubt that, but those are exactly the things that should be reported to the committee because it's a policy decision ultimately for us to make. Is it worth the risk? Is it worth the risk of that blowback uh, in light of the information that we gather? Um, so I think we have a lot more work to do with you to make sure that we're getting the information we need. Well, the conduct of intelligence is premised on the notion that we can do it uh, secretly and we don't count on it being revealed in the newspaper. So that would change the criterion, obviously. And if, if uh, what we embark on in the way of a collection activity because of its potential blowback, if revealed publicly, that is, uh, that's a, that's a, a, higher, a higher threshold or a lower one, I guess, for um, providing more uh, notification. Well, I, I find it very hard to understand why, if this information was deemed too sensitive to be shared with the Intelligence Committee, it was not so sensitive that it wasn't accessible to a low-level systems analyst like Mr. Snowden. You know, part of the challenge in all this is, if we're honest with each other, the mechanisms of governance within our nation right now do not enjoy broad trust and confidence among many elements of our citizenry. That's a tough thing to acknowledge. It doesn't help us as a nation that that's the case, but it is the case. And so one thing I try to tell the team out of Fort Meade is, I am not gonna waste my time wishing the world was a certain way. We're gonna acknowledge the way the world is, we're gonna make sure we understand the context in which we operate, and we're going to be effective in doing that. Um, and we just have to acknowledge that this is part of this challenge. Much of what we structured initially, if you go back historically for us, was we ensured Congress, as the elected representatives of the citizens of this nation, 
were among the primary tools to ensure NSA's compliance. And yet we find ourselves in a situation where much of our public doesn't trust many elements or has low confidence in many elements of our government. So what do you do when your compliance strategy was founded on that approach? We, we've got to broaden this a little bit. So that's one of the reasons why you find me here tonight. And um, hopefully you're going to see some things over the course of the next few months where we're trying to have a dialogue. I'm not out here to sell anything. I'm not out here to necessarily convince anybody. What I've told the team is stick to the facts and let people make well-informed decisions as to what they are comfortable with. That's what we need to do. We need to focus on the mission and stick to the facts. One last quick, quick question. Yes, ma'am. Um, those of us who support and have worked with both the Fort Meade area and DHS have sensed a tension over the years um, in, in, the, in roles and missions related to the cyber arena. So what is the partnership that you have in place or are putting in place with DHS? Well, I would tell you, for me, I'm very fortunate. Um, I partner with a cabinet secretary in the form of Jay Johnson, who I've worked with before in my career. And once it's secured, as confirmed, by border states, not by Homeland Security. They can't be trusted. Um, and I love the fact it is just, Jay will just pick up the phone and talk to Rogers, and Rogers will just pick up the phone and talk to Secretary Johnson about, hey, I think we need to do this, I think we need to do that. He and I, we meet regularly. Um, we have talked to our teams about what we need to do to create stronger partnerships. You know, what I have argued is, NSA and U.S. Cyber Command bring great capability to the cyber mission set. But we have got to do this in a partnership with others. And in the federal government, probably our two biggest partners are DHS and the FBI. Um, and that's the way it's going to be. That's what we need to do. I am not about control, as the, the team at Fort Meade has to hear me say. It is not about control. It's about outcomes. I don't care who gets the credit. I am willing to provide manpower and capability to support others, and I don't care if they get the credit. This is about helping to defend America and its allies. It's about providing a capability for the greater good. First, I want to discuss a perpetual problem at the FBI, whistleblower protection. Director Mueller has repeatedly assured me that he will not tolerate retaliation against whistleblowers at the FBI. Despite these assurances, two particular whistleblower cases have been dragging on for years. These cases are largely fueled by the FBI's desire to continue appeal rulings and findings of wrongdoing by FBI supervisors. FBI agent Jane Turner filed a whistleblower complaint in 2002 when she discovered FBI agents were removing items from Ground Zero following 9-11. She faced retaliation for raising concerns about these agents, and her case has been stuck in administrative limbo at uh, Justice Department for over nine years.